This is one of the most important videos you'll watch this week because there's a magical, mystical, dangerous spell that infects the minds of law enforcers and their bootlicking fan base, which causes them all to believe the fairy tale that officer safety is far superior to your individual right to be secured and protected from all unreasonable searches and seizures. It would probably be safe to say that most Americans are unaware of the landmark Supreme Court case, Terry v. Ohio. So there's also a good chance that there are few who recognize the constitution trampling impact this case has had on our freedoms in America and the role it still plays in empowering and furthering the psychopathy, brutality, and frankly, criminality in American policing today. Terry v. Ohio is a landmark case where eight of the robe tyrants of the Supreme Court engaged in magical euphemistic terminology to decimate the Fourth Amendment shield, guaranteeing your right to be safe and secure in your person. They did this by creating an imaginary distinction between searches and seizures and their new phraseology, stop and frisk. Frisking the outer clothing for weapons, they said, is not a full-blown search for evidence of a crime. So the court gave itself and for-profit law enforcement agencies a license to violate the sacred oath to protect the public by making up the excuse that in all cases, officer safety eclipses individual liberty. In short, the Constitution says you have the right to be secure in your person, and the courts and the cops say you don't. From Terry v. Ohio sprung the unconstitutional concept known as RAS, or Reasonable Articulable Suspicion, which relies solely on the subjective feelings of the law enforcement class rather than the probable cause standard of objective articulable fact supported by hard evidence that a crime has been committed called probable cause. On October 31st, Halloween day of 1963, police officer Martin McFadden, a 30 year veteran of the force, was on duty in downtown Cleveland, Ohio, when he noticed two men standing on a street corner. One of the men, John W. Terry, walked down the street, looked through a certain store window, then continued on before turning around and returning to where he started, stopping on his way back to look in the store window again. The other man, Richard Chilton, repeated Terry's movements. Officer McFadden claims that he watched the pair repeat this routine about a dozen times. A third man then joined Terry and Chilton, and the three walked up the street together toward the store. McFadden suspected that the men had been casing the store in preparation for robbing it, so he followed and confronted them. He asked the men's name, but they gave non-committal mumbling answers. Officer McFadden then grabbed Terry and Chilton, spun them around, patted down their exterior clothing, and discovered that they both had pistols in their jacket pockets. Officer McFadden ordered the three men into the store where he removed Terry's overcoat, told the men to face the wall with their hands raised, and proceeded to pat down the other two men. During Detective McFadden's pat down of the other men, McFadden seized a revolver from Chilton's outside overcoat pocket. McFadden did not go inside the interior of Cat's clothing as he found nothing to indicate a weapon during his pat down of Cat's. So McFadden arrested Terry and Chilton for carrying concealed weapons in violation of Ohio law. At this point, if the Supreme Court justices were just and stayed true to their constitutional promise, they would have made it clear that Ohio state law is null and void because it violates the Second Amendment's shall not be infringed directive. Ironically, and to the surprise of no one, the Supreme Court justices are not just and remained silent about the unconstitutional Ohio law. At trial, Terry and Chilton's counsel moved to suppress the weapons, arguing that the guns had been seized incident to an unlawful arrest, which constitutionally was the wrong argument because men can carry any arm they want as per the Second Amendment. The court denied this motion, holding that the officer had cause to believe that Terry and Chilton were acting in a suspicious manner, 
that McFadden's interrogation was warranted and that the officer had reasonable cause to pat down the suspects for his own personal protection, thus giving cops permission to violate everyone's Fourth Amendment right if the cop feels unsafe. The court said that they recognize a distinction quote, between an investigatory stop and an arrest and between a frisk of the outer clothing for weapons and a full-blown search for evidence of a crime, end quote. Terry and Chilton were convicted and the Ohio Court of Appeals affirmed the convictions on appeal. The Ohio Supreme Court dismissed Terry and Chilton's appeal, finding, quote, no substantial constitutional question sufficient to warrant review. Chief Justice Earl Warren delivered the opinion of the court for an eight-justice majority. Justices Hugo Black, John M. Harlan, and Byron White authored concurring opinions, but signed on to the court's opinion as well. After a factual and procedural review of the case, Chief Justice Warren noted the, quote, difficult and troublesome issues, issues which had never been squarely presented to the court, that the case presented. Chief Justice framed the issues like this, quote, On the one hand, it is frequently argued that in dealing with the rapidly unfolding and often dangerous situations on city streets, the police are in need of an escalating set of flexible responses graduated in relation to the amount of information they possess. For this purpose, he said, it is argued that distinctions should be made between a stop and an arrest or a seizure of a person and between a frisk and a search. On the other side, he said, it is contended with some force that there is not and cannot be a variety of police activity which does not depend solely upon voluntary cooperation of the citizen and yet which stops short of an arrest based upon probable cause to make such an arrest. End quote. And in case you're wondering, this is where the convoluted word salad argument, you're not under arrest, you're just being detained, comes from. In acknowledging the, quote, limitations of the judicial function, Chief Justice Warren framed the court's opinion around a, quote, quite narrow question posed by the facts. That is, whether it is always unreasonable for a policeman to seize a person and subject him to a limited search for weapons unless there is probable cause for his arrest. After conceding in his opinion that there was no question that McFadden both searched and seized Terry and Chilton within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment, Warren still argued that an assessment of the reasonableness of McFadden's search and seizure was necessary. For the Fourth Amendment only protects us against searches that are unreasonable, he said. The Chief Justice maintained that, quote, there is no ready test for determining reasonableness other than by balancing the need to search or seize against the invasion which the search or seizure entails. And in justifying that particular intrusion, the police officer must be able to point to specific and articulable facts which, taken together with rational inferences from those facts, reasonably warrant that intrusion. Crap like this again demonstrates the wisdom of the founders. Chief Justice Warren says this is needed, and the founders said that necessity is the plea for every infringement of human freedoms. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves. So definitely the chief justices played their role as the tyrants. In his assessment of balance between Officer McFadden's safety and the scale and scope of McFadden's search, Chief Justice Warren concluded that McFadden's search was reasonable. The Chief Justice, in affirming the convictions, outlined the proper circumstances in which searches of the type that McFadden performed would be considered reasonable. Warren said, quote, where a police officer observes unusual conduct, which leads him reasonably to conclude in light of his experience that criminal activity may be afoot and that the persons with whom he is dealing may be armed and presently dangerous, where in the course of investigating this behavior, he identifies himself as a policeman and makes reasonable inquiries and where nothing in the initial stages of the encounter serves to dispel his reasonable fear for his own or other safety, 
he is entitled for the protection of himself and others in the area to conduct a carefully limited search of the outer clothing of such persons in an attempt to discover weapons which might be used to assault him. And of course, we all know that searches of this type were upheld as reasonable under the Fourth Amendment and are known as stop and frisk. And as a result of this case, these encounters are also known as Terry stops. Amidst the tyrannical insanity, as eight of the justices shredded the Fourth Amendment, stood Justice William O. Douglas. Douglas was the only justice to honor his oath as he authored the lone dissent in this case. Justice Douglas felt that the Fourth Amendment did not allow for searches and seizures of any form absent a showing of probable cause. Douglas noted, quote, I agree that the petitioner was seized within the meaning of the Fourth Amendment. I also agree that frisking petitioner and his companions for guns was a search, but it is a mystery how that search and that seizure can be constitutional by Fourth Amendment standards unless there was probable cause to believe that number one, a crime had been committed, number two, a crime was in the process of being committed, or number three, a crime was about to be committed. I got my reservations on the last one, but I'll save that for another video. He said, the opinion of the court disclaims the existence of probable cause. We hold today that the police have greater authority to make a seizure and conduct a search than a judge has to authorize such action. We have said precisely the opposite over and over again. In other words, Douglas said, police officers up to today have been permitted to effect arrests or searches without warrants only when the facts within their personal knowledge would satisfy the constitutional standard of probable cause. At the time of their seizure without a warrant, they must possess facts concerning the person arrested that would have satisfied a magistrate that probable cause was indeed present. And check this out. Douglas says the term probable cause rings a bell of certainty that is not sounded by phrases such as reasonable suspicion. Moreover, the meaning of probable cause, he says, is deeply embedded in our constitutional history. So even back then, Douglas resisted the unconstitutional and weak reasonable articulable suspicion argument. Douglas further said, quote, the requirement of probable cause has roots that are deep in our history. The general warrant in which the name of the person to be arrested was left blank and the writs of assistance both perpetuated the oppressive practice of allowing the police to arrest and search on suspicion. Police control took the place of judicial control since no showing of probable cause before a magistrate was required. The infringement on personal liberty of any seizure of any person can only be reasonable under the Fourth Amendment if we require the police to possess probable cause before they seize him. Only that line draws a meaningful distinction between an officer's mere inkling and the presence of facts within the officer's personal knowledge, which would convince a reasonable man that the person seized has committed a particular crime. And then Douglas says, to give the police greater power than a magistrate is to take a long step down the totalitarian path. He says, perhaps such a step is desirable to cope with modern forms of lawlessness, but if it is taken, it should be the deliberate choice of the people through a constitutional amendment. And I completely disagree. Rights are never on the table for discussion. Douglas contends, until the Fourth Amendment, which is closely allied with the Fifth, is rewritten, the person and effects of the individual are beyond the reach of all government agencies until there are reasonable grounds to believe, which is probable cause, that a criminal venture has been launched or is about to be launched. Douglas says, quote, there have been powerful hydraulic pressures throughout our history that bear heavily on the court to water down constitutional guarantees and give the police the upper hand. That hydraulic pressure has probably never been greater than it is today. He'd probably be turning over in his grave to find out what was going on in 2023. 
He says, yet if the individual is no longer to be sovereign, if the police can pick him up whenever they do not like the cut of his jib, if they can seize and search him in their discretion, then we enter a new regime. And then he closes it with this. The decision to enter that regime should be made only after a full debate by the people of this country. And that's where I disagree with Douglas. The discussion to limit the rights of the people should never be entered in the first place. If you're interested in me making a dedicated video on Douglas' entire dissenting opinion, let me know in the comments section. Take a second right now to subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification icon, give it a thumbs up, share it with everybody you know, and don't forget to subscribe to my private email list through my website, highimpactflix.com. If you want to support the channel, grab a hard-hitting conversation starting design you can get from the store, put on any shirt, hoodie, mug, cell phone case, whatever you want. The other support links are in the description and the pinned comment. I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.